Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL course on Rural Water Resource Management. This is week six and we are at lecture one. Let's see what we have seen in lecture five. We looked at in detail the groundwater hydrology components. We made sure that we understood the key hydrology components in the groundwater component. And we then further progressed on finding the measurements and data where it can be available. We also looked at the role of groundwater in the overall hydrology. Now moving on, since we have looked at the groundwater as a important resource, we will look at the other resource, which is very important, which is the surface water hydrology. So in this week, week six, we will be looking at the types of surface water storages, mostly in the rural regions because we are dealing with rural water resource in this course. We will also look at rural water bodies and lakes. We will look at methods for irrigation <coughs> from the lakes. For example, how do you take water from uh, rivers and lakes within the rural system? It's not only a running water, but also stored water. So ponds, lakes, etc., etc. And then there is a big concern on what is being happening in the current scenario. Most of the villages are experiencing loss and conversion of lakes. We will look into why this phenomena is happening. Wherein we have disappearing of lakes, encroachments, and conversion from rural to urban. Disappearing is also kind of rural to urban, but most of the time disappearing just means that the entire lake or water body is drained and then construction is built on top of it. Or like in Kerala, you have vegetation growing on it or agricultural crops. <coughs> Encroachments is where you block the water so that you drain it indirectly. And rural to urban conversions is again like where the urban center is increasing in size and some villages on the, on the boundary of the urban setting are losing the water bodies. Please understand that water bodies are government property and it is under no one's name. And so the boundaries are kind of very uh, not um, stringent. There is no exact line because one day the water body would be big and then one day because of summer it will be small, right? So there is a demarcation, however, people don't know and they start to encroach it and abduct it, saying that that is their land. This is the key reason why in Bangalore we have a lot of lakes that are lost. So let's dive into week six. First, why do we need surface water storage? We talked about groundwater storage, yes, but there are specifics to why we need surface water storage. <coughs> Let's look into detail the need of surface water structures. First, this uh, image we saw in the early part of the course, wherein we have a variation in rainfall. If you look at it, the rainfall is not the same across India and even within um, a village or within a district, you can have a high rainfall zone and then shared with a no rainfall zone or a rainfall shadow zone. This leads to variations in rainfall and or skewness. What we call is how rainfall is less in one area and high in another area. So spatial variability is a, a, a phenomenon which occurs because of the map you see here. 
it is not the same rainfall is not the same and if you make uh, furthermore iso heights or lines of equal rainfall you could see that uh, there are some within a small village or within a small district also you will have variations in rainfall spatial variability then we have a skewed rainfall pattern what is skewed rainfall it is not the same across every month because we are not in for example uh, in um, uh, these regions the northeast <coughs> you do have rainfall almost uh, every single day in um, the wettest part of the planet uh, but uh, in most regions at least weekly you'll have some rainfall a very little rainfall etc hill stations but most of the agriculturally active regions have a skewness which means 78 percent of the annual rainfall only happens in the monsoon months and that too between the peak monsoon here the peak monsoon is given as jjas we call it or june july august and september this is kind of the overall average for india even though it shifts where you are uh, most of the uh, monsoon is at the peak monsoon where uh, the annual india's annual rainfall happens 78% almost 80% of the rainfall happens in jjas if you look at it this is the average rainfall in millimeters monthly and you have jan feb march almost very uh, low rainfall pattern and then in may whereas you have the summer and in some regions the summer extends until may but after may you have june july august september so here we say that uh, every uh, june 6th you will have rain in mumbai or in maharashtra that is the onset of the monsoon so but before we get the monsoon the monsoon comes from kerala so here the monsoon is coming and uh, while it rises here maybe a week later after the monsoon onset we call onset is the uh, coming in of monsoon from there it can come here so just a week uh, more or less that's why you see this uh, variation but it's a beautiful probable distribution a bell curve we call it normal distribution uh, where you have more rainfall uh, happening in a particular concentrated zone or concentrated months uh, which range from june july august and september and then you have your winter uh, post monsoon seasons uh, uh, rainfall so if you look at it uh, there are some regions where there have zero rainfall uh, but because across india there are some regions which also get rainfall in jan and december we have for example uh, in kerala region in uh, the northeast region you do have rainfall uh, across most of the time you go to hill stations there is always rainfall right elevation uh, due to elevation gradients so the monthly average rainfalls uh, this is from 1871 2016 so uh, more than 100 years uh, rainfall from iitm shows that this is the average pattern and there is a skewness so because it is happening only in a concentrated time you need to capture it so that you can use it for the remaining months what do you mean by lean months lean is like how i'm lean or you have lean chicken thin okay so in another word what it means is these are the lean months whereas less rainfall is happening so if you say what is the average rainfall okay so maybe somewhere here you can draw a line below the average uh, you will call lean or below average months and then this is the above average months which is for sure during the peak uh, rainfall season you will have above average rainfall moving on we have to capture this rainfall so that we can use it for the lean months both your summer spring which is before the monsoon and after the monsoon which is your winter season so water needs to be stored and groundwater we saw in the previous uh, week lecture it can be stored but the rate is very low so it is very slow compared to the rainfall the rainfall can happen uh, for example 50 millimeters uh, in a week but uh, it cannot go that fast into the ground remember it has to go infiltration percolation and then go to the groundwater aquifer so that doesn't happen that fast so that is why we are in need of surface water structures it can protect uh, and also reduce the damage during the floods and uh, extreme events of climate change which are droughts and floods let's say drought let's take an example 
you have a drought, which is a less rainfall year. So if you have a less rainfall year and you've already captured the previous year's rainfall in a uh, storage system, surface storage system, we will look at what are the systems in the upcoming, uh, just this uh, lecture. Uh, but uh, let's think like a tank, okay? You're capturing the water from rainfall and river and storing it in a tank. That can be used for the lean season, which is the right next, the post monsoon season and also in a drought year. For example, 2020 was a good rainfall year and then 2021 was a drought year. If you catch the rainfall in 2020 and conserve it, you can use it in the 2021 drought year. So that is what a climate extreme drought, how you can use rainfall from storage structures. How does it uh, reduce damage in floods? Suppose you have a big flood coming through your river system and on the land and it just inundates the area. If you don't hold it, at least in smaller quantities, what happens is the water gets collected and comes downstream and floods more. So these structures actually hold this water for a particular period of time or until the volume is reached. Uh, for example, a dam, let's say a dam, it will just stop all the water and until the wa dam water is full. Suppose the dam was not there and there's a big flood, all the water would come and flood the entire area. So this is how these surface storage structures help in a climate extreme and climate extreme also means drought and flood. So in both seasons, it does help. It improves groundwater recharge. For example, if it stores the water in the sto storage, Okay, the water is stored, then there is also infiltration and evaporation is happening. So the infiltration you cannot stop unless it is lined. Lined means you put cement on the bottom of the tank. Like for example, a petrol uh, tank, you don't put um, uh, nothing under the tank. You have to put a lining so that petrol doesn't seep in. Swimming pool, you put a uh, cement uh, lining on the sides, otherwise water will just get leaked into the aquifer. So, it, so we're talking about a natural system uh, for agriculture where it stores the water and it can recharge. Suitable for areas with hard rock, terrain, non-porous soil because groundwater uh, is needed and it takes a long time to recharge. So when you store this water and push it into the ground, it can recharge slowly because you're also creating a potential head. When you have a dam or a storage, the water level will rise and it creates enough energy to accelerate pushing the groundwater into the recharge. Provides a dependable source of water for local communities. If you look at the water storage structures like a dam or a, a small water uh, lake, agricultural lake, you could see that around the system, around the uh, storage structure, there is a lively lively waterhood developed uh, by the locals. For example, fishing, and it could be the drinking water supply for them and also agricultural means. So it is vital for the su substance of rural livelihoods uh, through agriculture and allied activities. When I say allied activities, it includes fish, uh, livestock, cattle, um, <coughs> poultry, anything that supports your agricultural livelihoods. And it also ensures drinking water security, even though drinking water is less compared to the use of other um, uh, units that I've described, still it is very, very important. So these structures could provide good drinking water source during the lean season, which is drought or the high flood season. Let's take a look at the surface uh, water storage structures in India. Okay, so um, the current storage as per MOSP 2018 says that the reservoir is around 2.93 million hectares. Uh, tanks and ponds occupy 2.43 million hectares. Uh, floodplain lakes and derelict water bodies around 0.8 uh, million hectares and brackish water is 1.15 million hectares. So this gives a, a good understanding that uh, your reservoirs, which is tanks and big storage structures, occupy the most uh, area in India, uh, followed by tanks and ponds. The floodplain or, and brackish are smaller, however, your tanks and ponds, small tanks in villages um, and uh, your uh, rural ponds uh, still occupy a good chunk of space. 
the current storage capacity in India is less than one tenth of the annual rainfall. So if you compare this volume, so this million hectares, uh, multiply the thickness and the volume, total volume stored, uh, and then you compare it with the <coughs> volume of rainfall we have, it is not even one tenth of the annual rainfall, which means 90% uh, of the rainfall is let to go into rivers, water storage, uh, in uh, groundwater and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Is it good or not? That is a different question because you still need your rivers and, and lakes uh, and streams to flow. But um, is it all washed away into the uh, oceans and seas is the question. Okay, so that number we don't have exactly, we need to calculate. So construction of new structures and restoration of old structures is very important because we are losing a lot of water into the uh, oceans and rivers, which can be captured for a water hungry nation like um, uh, India, where agriculture is predominantly uh, using a lot of water and it is very, very needed to have this water supply. <coughs> Not only uh, India, but almost all South Asian um, countries are water hungry, which means the population is increasing. There is a demand for um, water to sustain the livelihoods and demand for agricultural productivity. So all these countries are actually uh, wanting more water. You cannot create water, so you need to store and then capture as much as water uh, is there. And given the transboundary natures and um, uh, international uh, you know, issues in getting the water between countries, it is always uh, smart to at least use the water that you collect in rainfall. Capture it, use it, uh, and then um, uh, make sure you're not wasting too much water into the um, oceans and uh, seas, considering your agricultural needs. So let's continue looking at uh, the uh, large dam. So it is uh, 5,334 large dams are in India as on 2019. Um, and uh, these large dams is one type of a surface water storage and it is the biggest. Okay, Everyone knows how a dam looks like, we'll have some images, uh, but dams <coughs> have their own uh, positives which are uh, benefits of dams include uh, flood production because it is a massive storage. Uh, it is a couple of feet high, you know, like it's not like you cannot just jump in and uh, swim for days, you know, it, it's, it's too big. So dams are pretty, pretty. Um, that's why you cannot allow, you're not allowed to swim in a dam zone. Okay, it's massive. So it can actually capture the flood water and buffer, act as a buffer, which means a storage space where excess water can be put. Okay. And it also increases your food production because uh, you, you have an irrigated area. So once you store the water, that water is released into the command area we call, wherein water goes into the land for uh, agriculture. It's supplied in the, in the land for agriculture. If you look at the number of uh, large dams, so there is a, a difference between large dams, check dams, and small dams, medium dams. So large dams are the biggest, which are uh, not only for irrigation, but also for hydroelectric generation which accounts to almost 11%, 10.5% of total power generation. So also India is in need of power, right? Electricity, because we are also pushing industrial development and we need a lot of power. We have solar and et cetera, but hydroelectricity is also generated. So if you look at this, you have um, the number of dams, uh, big dams, large dams in India. Um, and it's not easy to, to, to make these dams, right? Because if before the British, um, um, uh, gave us uh, independence when they were ruling us. So you could see that not uh, they built a big, big dams and still operational, um, uh, but uh, was, was slightly managed. <laughs> Their motives were different. They didn't want much for India's development. But after India's independence, that's when we started to push um, more on the large dam scenario. Uh, and then because of uh, the anti-benefits um, also or, or um, the issues with large dams, there has been a slowdown and not much you can build. Also, the lands are already occupied by large dams. So let's look at some of the positives. As I said, food production is increased, hydroelectricity is increased, flood control, it can buffer the flood water, and all this water can be piped into a, a water supply. For example, all the dams in Pune areas are catering to the, the drinking water supply of Mumbai, 
because in a city of Mumbai, you cannot afford to put a dam. It's, it's too um, expensive, the land, um, where it is the industrial capital of the country. Uh, so where would you, uh, sorry, the economic capital of the country, where would you put all these, uh, you know, dams? You cannot. So <clears throat> uh, the water supply is taken from outside, similar in Delhi, you know, water is taken from outside. So uh, these uh, dams uh, do help in drinking water supply, not only for that region, but for miles and kilometers away. But there are a lot of issues. If you look at dams, uh, um, there is a difference between naturally managed water and engineer. Uh, dams are more engineered structures, which means it is a kind of there to, to stop the natural movement. Um, and it's not um, accounting for the natural uh, dependencies of water. For example, you have downstream, you have uh, e-flow, which is the environment uh, requirement of water. So all this is not thoroughly um, uh, taken up by large dams. There are some issues. Time and cost overrun, that's a huge cost uh, involved in time to build it. Just recently, you would have noticed the Uttarakhand uh, Dam. They built it in such large uh, time and money, but it just got washed away. Uh, there are a lot of environmental impacts. You have to clear the land. Uh, there is a lot of uh, people's livelihood. Displacement happens. You have to clear the land, take the people away, relocate them. All this happens because it's a huge area. When you stop the water, a huge area has to be flooded. And that becomes the flood becomes your dam water. Correct? You just stop the water. One more thing <coughs> is the size or not alone the size alone. Uh, but also the environment factors, as I said, uh, it has to cater to the movement of water. So some environmental benefits are lost if you stop running water. Okay, so these are uh, mostly noted as the um, um, negatives of or issues of large dams uh, by these uh, authors given below. So you could see that, as I said, most of the dams were uh, uh, did uh, only after the independence. But there is a question, how did our ancestors do this? If, if we know that uh, dams were less during the British era, and before that it was really, really less, 1900s. So how did our ancestors, kings and others who, rule, who ruled before the Britishers, how did they uh, control this water? So there is a lot of traditional water resources storages. We call it um, surface water storage structures as SWSS, it just in short to, to uh, put it in the slides. Uh, so there is multiple methods. There is traditional, there's nature-based methods, and there is engineered methods. Let's look at the traditional methods to understand how their ancestors did it. So the first one we would look at is the Ahar Pine system, where flood water har uh, harvested uh, through um, a small area demarcated in the villages. And pines are the diversion channels, which take the water into these um, uh, small uh, stores uh, or storage uh, regions as ahars, which is reservoirs with embankment. So it's a small reservoir, <coughs> kind of a small dam, uh, but um, it is made with embankments, not much cement used, not much land is cleared. So normally what the uh, traditional ancestors did is to find a low-lying area in the village. And in that low-lying area, already water would have been uh, stored. So all they had to do is clear the land, put embankments on the sides, and then channelize the water. So instead of water moving in uh, every direction, like for example, like this, uh, moving in every uh, direction into the Aha, uh, they would uh, just make sure that it, it is all pulled into one channel, okay? So this is how they managed this um, uh, important, capture the rainwater, channelized it through these um, uh, pines, which are diversion channels and into ahars. And then they might have some uh, blocks to uh, stop the water, for example, like this. And from that blocks, uh, after a particular height is reached, people can use it for uh, fish, uh, drinking, livestock, and also, put smaller channels like this, loose gate, and then take the water into the villages, uh, into rural uh, lands, for example, for agriculture. Johads is another um, similar type <coughs> where smaller earthen buns to collect rainwater are done. It's not as big as the Ahar pine. 
and it is constructed in areas with high elevation in three sides and fourth side is protected by bun. So for example, you don't have a um, low lying area in the village, what would you do? So you, all you do, like for example here, all is elevation land, you would pick uh, uh, an area where all these four elevations are high uh, and the, the smallest elevation, which is the smallest height land uh, is used as a storage. So you just build a small earthen bund. Earthen bund is a, a structure like this and earth is just mud, sand and stones, it's not concrete. So which means earthen bunds still can do some recharge, still can have some leakages which are good. Um, and so this bund actually stops the water from these high elevations and, and starts a pool. So that pool of water can be used as a surface water storage. Moving on, we also have um, um, another very important uh, structure, which is tanks uh, in rural uh, lakes. So these are a demarcated simple land, which is um, channelizing water into and storing the water. So it's constructed across valleys to arrest the runoff. So small, small valleys you will have and all the runoff is arrested and put into it. Uh, and around the, um, the area, you will have mud uh, or stone based embankments. So basically you, the ancestors just dug this area through hand and plows and stuff, made a deeper um, uh, thickness of like a bigger well. Uh, and then all this water would come in and on the, on the surrounding edges, they made these embankments. Provides multitude of benefits such as irrigation, flood control, livelihood security, groundwater recharge. So because this is not lined, which means no cement is at the bottom, groundwater does recharge. <coughs> Excuse me. So therefore, it provides multiple, multiple um, benefits, not only for irrigation, not only for agricultural water use, flood control, as we saw, livelihood uh, for fish, uh, and then for food security, etc and uh, sanitation, people used to bathe there, and most importantly, groundwater recharge. How are they being abused? They are not uh, protected well. Um, if you look at it, uh, we will um, uh, cover some issues uh, of these tanks in the next class, uh, but uh, you would notice that in the villages, these tanks are not protected properly. As long as the tanks, uh, we also have another um, a tank system called the cascade tank system. So just visualize, we had one tank. So this is just one tank in the village. Uh, think about placing small tanks and connecting those tanks. So the ancestors are very smart. They thought, okay, first let's make one tank. And this tank could cater to the hamlets or the houses and villages around this tank. But then it can water can still go to another tank. So as one tank fills up, it, it goes through the channel and then fills another tank. So only after number four fills up, number three fills up, and then number two fills up, and then the bigger tank, number one fills up. And they built it along the tributaries also, <coughs> which is this line you see. So the river is like kind of stopped and a big tank is made. It's not a check dam, it is a big tank. So water flows into the river. Uh, and when water flows, a big tank is first filled up. And after the tank is filled up, the next tank and the next tank until the bigger tank is done. And once the bigger tank is full, it goes into the massive river out into the system. So all these are very, very important. And these are called cascading tanks. So one tank is filled and then another tank is filled and another tank. What we saw in the previous slide was an isolated tank. We just had a channel and then the water was filling. So what is the benefits of uh, tank cascades? It is a series of tanks, it's not one tank. So when you manage, you have to manage all the tanks together to get good water in number one, okay? Um, and then there is always surplus water uh, uh, is being taken from one tank to the other tank through downstream uh, links, okay? So these are the downstream links where uh, water would come. The lowest tank may have higher storage, which is the lowest rank or the low, low eleva lower elevation tanks, has more uh, storage because it can take the water from multiple resources and has the highest catchment area. So this catchment area is the highest compared to this tank, which is this is the catchment area. The breach of upper tank may affect downstream tank. So that is why it is very important to manage. And as I said in the previous slide, most of these tanks are not well managed because we'll look at the reasons in the future class in this week. Uh, there is no 
community participation, there's no funds for it, people don't take ownership. So all these issues are there. So there is a breach of <coughs> upper tank. And if that happens, uh, mostly all these tanks won't work well because all this water would come down uh, and then we lose this land. Uh, and then slowly this tank will also get um, um, broken because of this water coming in and slowly all these tanks will erode. So after one tank breaks, all these tanks, other tanks slowly will break. Periodic maintenance of tanks and feeder channels are very important. And even uh, the transboundary uh, tanks and transboundary uh, connecting channels like uh, the one in Koshi have to be properly managed and periodically uh, maintained. Otherwise, uh, a lot of issues can happen. So there is a loss, a lot of loss of these uh, tank systems, of traditional uh, tank systems. Um, um, let's see some of the reasons, uh, and we'll also touch upon this in the, in the upcoming lectures. Uh, there is a decline of traditional uh, systems, uh, surface water storage uh, systems, especially because of population and dependence increase. When population increases, people start to abuse and they take more than they want because of fear of others would take it. For example, here, if you could see water was around here, but then um, not proper maintenance, you can see trees growing, the, the rocks uh, broken, the, the stairs broken, all of it. So if you don't manage it and people are using it, and so they should also manage it, either the government or the local people. Land use land cover changes because you uh, tend to abuse it, you tend to uh, encroach it, these tank systems are gone, the traditional systems are gone. Uh, community disconnect and disuse, <coughs> as I said, if those who are using are not going to take care of it, we will lose the tanks. We will lose the uh, water bodies, the ponds. Lack of maintenance and upkeeping. Uh, there's no ownership. There's no money set for these uh, revival of these uh, systems. Uh, and um, uh, people don't understand the connection um, um, uh, with groundwater. And also people uh, have the access to individual groundwater. So they have just started to abuse these systems. They don't care about, look how it's broken. And once it's broken, slowly it uh, gets demolished and no one takes care of it. So there is a need for revival of traditional SWSS, especially because uh, India has uh, already 54% um, uh, stress and it is going to increase pretty bad uh, as per this report. Uh, acute water stress is going to happen. <coughs> Groundwater is already depleting uh, and the increasing water trends, as I said, because of population and overuse. Lifestyle has changed. Everyone wants to wash their car. Uh, using fresh water, you know, and which is not correct. So uh, when that happens, uh, you need more water to actually uh, get into this lifestyle. And there is increased uh, frequency of extreme events, namely floods and droughts. Uh, so there is a, a very, very important aspect to conserve these uh, structures, uh, capture more of this water before we lose it into the main oceans and, and big rivers. With this, I would like to conclude today's uh, lecture. I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.